Good evening. Great to be back with you this evening as we continue our trek through the Sermon on the Mount. Tonight I want to read from Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the word of God. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father in heaven, I pray that you'd be with us as we go through this text this evening, that, O oh Lord, we might discern its truth and apply it to our minds and our hearts. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> as we have been going through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been telling us about the character of the Christian life. And today he comes to the beginning of his application. And so what we have is this. It is not enough to think that we can love our enemies and not judge one another and apply the golden rule uh, or whatever and let that be it. That is not enough. Living the Christian life is not walking in the broad way while doing good at the same time. In other words, it is not having one foot in the world's way and the other foot in the kingdom's way. You're either all in or you're all out. It involves a total antithesis to everything that is not Christian. <clears throat> Today, then, we want to discuss entering through the straight gate, entering the kingdom on the way to eternal life through the straight gate. Now, this is not straight as in S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, which would be like straight down that aisle in front of me here with no turns to the left or the right. That is not what it means. This is straight, spelled S-T-R-A-I-T. It means narrow, restricted, tight, confined. Think, if you will, straight jacket or being in dire straits. The propositional idea of this sermon this evening is that, it is, is that that is the kind of gate that we enter and the path that we engage when we become Christians. There are two main implications, and they are that the Christian life is narrow in its commencement and narrow in its continuation. Those will be the two parts of this evening's sermon. First of all, then, the Christian life is narrow in its commencement. Commencement means the beginning. The gate itself through which a person must go to become a Christian is narrow. The entrance is narrow. <clears throat> When it, is interest, uh, when it is entered, immediately, I mean like right now, as soon as a person goes through, one is in the narrow way. The gate is narrow, the way is narrow. Now there are those who say that that is not so. That you can accept Jesus as Savior today and only worry about receiving him as Lord later on. <clears throat> but... Is that not to say that we can enter through the narrow gate as in the only way to God, namely through Jesus, but then find ourselves immediately in the broad way, which is okay because we are in Jesus, only to come to the narrow part later if and when we feel like doing it? That is exactly what they say albeit announced to them, perhaps. But Jesus says that it is not as though the way begins broad as soon as you go through the narrow gate that it suddenly becomes broad and then narrows at some point later on. He says it begins narrow and abruptly so, and it stays narrow. 
Another misunderstanding about this is that some believe that the Christian life sometimes is portrayed as attractive, as exciting, as, as something everybody else is doing. It's easy. Just come on in with the Christian crowd. Life with Jesus is just one big, exciting adventure. Uh, youth trips, uh, youth group meetings, uh, singing youth group songs by somebody strumming a guitar and all that kind of stuff. No. Life with Jesus is not just some big, exciting adventure full of possibilities where the action is and always fun. But Jesus says, the gate begins narrow. Only one at a time can go in. It is an individual thing, in other words, that one does when he enters in by the narrow gate. <clears throat> now, since it is so narrow, not everyone, or not everything, rather, can go through. We must leave some stuff behind. I'll give you an illustration. Traveling into Israel, did that a couple of times, about 40 years or so ago. You have to go through customs, and the baggage must be inspected. And sometimes people are even strip searched just to get into the country. And anything not allowable is forfeited. You try to bring something into the country which is not allowable by the country, and it's gone, or you don't get in. Then, once that baggage has gotten rid of, once that contraband is destroyed or thrown away, then a person has status in the country. Then he can enter in. If he brings in contraband, then he is guilty, and he is subject to the condemnation of the law. It is the same thing here with the narrow gate. When we walk through the narrow gate, we are entering a new country. It is called the kingdom of God. And to enter there, we must leave two things behind. They are the world and the way of the world. Let's talk about each. <clears throat> First of all, to enter the kingdom of God, one must leave the world behind. And by this, I mean this. The Christian way of life is not a popular way of life. When a person becomes a Christian, he sometimes must make a break with a vast crowd of people. He should know that. To be a Christian means that a person must make a deliberate decision to break with the crowd and enter that gate alone. It is an intensely personal decision. It makes you, in one sense, feel alone. That's why, quite frankly, many people don't do it. I've known of people who refuse to make a commitment to Christ, refuse to join the church. Why? Because they had to be baptized. And they did not want to stand out like that. They didn't want to be alone. They didn't want to have the focus put on them in the application of water. If we already feel alone, we'll reach, you know, before that, we'll reach out for companionship. But if we're part of the crowd, no matter how miserable our circumstances, we do not want to break out and become alone. People just don't want to do it. To enter then the narrow gate means that a person has to step out alone. He has to make his commitment to Christ. He has to trust in the blood of Christ. He has to do it. He doesn't do it as a member of a group. He does it as an individual who does it for himself. He must make a conscious, lone decision to enter the straight gate, to enter into a trusting, personal relationship with Jesus, to be a Christian. Perhaps the best illustration of a desire to be part of the crowd, or at least a good one, a good illustration would be the hippie movement of, what, 30, 40 years ago. 
Oh, they all said they were all so rebellious. They were a bunch of nonconformists. They're doing their own things, being natural and free. That was what the hippies said. So what did they do? Well, they all wore the same clothes and they all lived in the same places and they all had the same hairstyle and they all spoke the same vocabulary. They all had everything just alike. They weren't really very rebellious, were they? They certainly were not very individualistic. The point is, nobody wants to be alone. We just don't like it. It makes us feel lonely. But that fact must be considered if someone expects to be a Christian. He must consider the fact that he is leaving behind that in many, which in many respects made him feel at home. Leaving behind in many respects that which made him belong to the crowd. Now by this I do not mean that we will be alone when we become Christians, but that our becoming Christians is something that each one must do without worry about others or what they think or whether they come along and so forth. When you become a Christian, you become responsible for your life. No more does it matter what other people are doing. The, uh, as a Christian, your identity is, quite frankly, rather conspicuous. You will stand alone at times when perhaps you might wish for anonymity. The Christian life is not always easy and having to stand out against the crowd sometimes is part of it. The narrow gate reminds the Christian that only one person at a time goes through. It is through the broad gate that many go together. Everyone easily goes to the broad gate. But when it comes to the narrow gate, only one at a time goes through. Going through one at a time then reminds one that he is a responsible being himself before God. The other thing that the believer must leave behind, so the first thing we see that the believer must leave behind is the world. The second thing or the other thing that the believer must leave behind is the way of the world. It's one thing to leave behind the crowd. It is another thing to leave behind the way of the crowd. This is the struggle of every sinner who ever submitted to and trusted in Jesus. The question is, what do I do now? I'm different. I've walked through the gate. I've trusted in Christ. I now stand in the narrow way. What do I do now? The shores of Christendom are littered with the corpses of men and women who have, quote, made decisions for Christ and then be left to figure it out because their churches didn't do the job when that, uh, to tell them what to do when, once these folks had walked the aisle and made their decisions. People don't leave years of custom and behavior behind just because they have, quote, accepted Christ, whatever that means. They have been used to desiring revenge, for instance. They've been used to protesting their own innocence. They've been used to putting self before everything else. They've been used to relying upon their own wits. They've been used to judging harshly, to laying up treasures on earth, to practicing their righteousness before men, and generally doing what everybody else does who is not in the narrow way. And now, once they have entered that gate, they are expected to stand alone. They are expected to change all that. They are expected to do what they don't like to do. Yes, unless we wish to be among those whose bodies are littering the shore of Christendom, that is exactly what we are to do. There is no room for the baggage of the old man, his hates, his prejudices, his selfishness, 
and all of the other things that characterize his pre-regenerate life. Jesus tells us at the beginning, it is not always going to be easy. Count the cost. More. Since only one can go through one at a time, the old man, and not just his baggage, must be left behind also. Now, this cannot be done entirely, I know, but he must be continually being crucified. The old man must be continually mortified, crucified, uh, gotten rid of as much as is humanly possible. He cannot come in beside you in the narrow gate. There is no room for both the old man and the new man to walk in together side by side. The old man has no place in the kingdom. The sign at the gate says, leave yourself outside. Sometimes Christians have difficulty with this. They say, well, I'll get even with him sometime. Or she treated me so bad and I'll never forget it. Or how dare him do that to me. The life that begins at the narrow gate is a life of self-deprecation. It is not a life which seeks revenge anymore as it was beforehand. One final word. This does not mean now that you cannot enjoy life anymore. It means that we deny our right to self, leaving it outside the gate. Repeating with Paul, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life that I live, uh, now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the Christian life is narrow in its commencement. But it is also that the Christian life is narrow in its continuation. The one who enters through the narrow gate embarks on a new life. A new life, that's, that's the path. He's gone through the gate. He has trusted in Christ. He's now on the path. He's on a new path. He's never been on this path before. And what that means is living like Jesus himself as much as we know and as much as we can do. Sometimes that involves suffering. The Christian is set apart to be sanctified, to emulate the example of Jesus who underwent a great deal of suffering during his time on earth. If a man follows Jesus consistently, then people will often misunderstand him. And when they misunderstand Christians, sometimes they get pretty mean. Well, from whom is the Christian set apart? Well, from the world, you say. Well, who or what is the world? It might be your own family. It might be that close to home. So often, family interferes with a person's practice of religion. If you're sold out to Jesus, then you are not sold out to family. And if conflict ever arises, that can cause some big problems. In fact, it will cause problems with all those who are not Christians because they will not understand how you can put Christ ahead of family. I hear people say things like, well, God doesn't expect me to go against mama or daddy. I mean, doesn't the Bible say, honor your father and your mother? I'll give you an illustration. Uh, I will never forget the organist that I had in a church whose life, quite frankly, was miserable as long as his mother was alive. And she didn't die until he was way up in age, up into his 50s or so. He had never married. He had lived at home. Why? 
because she controlled his life. And when he would talk about it, when he was asked about it, in defense he would say, well, the Bible says that we should honor our parents, shouldn't we? I find that sort of argument, quite frankly, to be the easy way out sometimes because mama and daddy don't impose the requirements which God does. One can place himself under the everlasting control of mama and daddy and live an irresponsible life and feel okay about it because it offers the easy way out. I'm supposed to honor my father and my mother. But God says to grow up and follow where he leads even if that is not popular at the time, even if it is not popular with parents or friends or other family or extended relationships. If one is to be a Christian, then he must be ready to endure the misunderstanding of those who are closest to him. Not only has he been set apart from the world, but from any member of his family who is not a Christian. The Christian life is to be lived daily. There are no holidays to the Christian life. The road doesn't get broader when he gets off with the guys. The road doesn't get broader when we go on vacation. The road doesn't get broader when we can let our hair down. No, the road is always narrow. Something of interest, while also very disappointing to me personally, often, is that people will go on vacation and expect God to, to get them there and back safely, but they don't give him a second thought on the Lord's Day while they are on vacation. It is one day in seven, just, just like all the other days. You think they would stop and find a church to worship? It's, 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 it's beyond, beyond potentiality or even possibility that some of them would do that. Oh, I don't want to go in there and be a stranger in a church, they say. <sighs> and you go on vacation. You don't take a vacation from God. And you don't expect God to take a vacation from you. We are always wrestling with principalities and powers. And principalities and powers don't take a holiday. And we don't expect God to take a holiday when it comes to our own, uh, our own safety and so forth on vacation. So why should we take one from him? We're still in the narrow way, even if we're not at home. Jesus didn't say here, the narrow way is, is just now here in Pearl, Mississippi, but if you go traveling somewhere, uh, you're in the Broadway and that's okay. No, not at all. And so the Christian begins his life, his Christian life, by going through the narrow gate and being in the narrow way. That is not the end of our spiritual quest, but it is the beginning of our spiritual life. And this brings us to our conclusion. Think about what Jesus has said. He didn't preach this sermon to them and to us so that folks could say, oh, what a fine sermon. He didn't just give it just so people would repent and be forgiven. He gave it so that people would understand the necessity to be able to spend the remainder of their Christian lives considering and applying it to their lives so that they could live those lives for the glory of God. Conversion is the beginning of the Christian life. The first step, first step, is through the narrow gate. But for most of us, the end of the narrow, gate, narrow path is quite some way off. We still have a few days to live yet. And Jesus told us to count the cost before taking his name. Remember the parable of the man who tried to put up the tower without figuring what it would cost? 
Jesus said there, count the cost before you build. Remember the parable of the king who went to fight another without assessing the strength of his enemy? Jesus says, count the cost. It's going to be costly. You better plan on counting on that when you enter through the straight gate and start down the way of life of the straight path. We are not saved to escape punishment. We are not saved to escape the problems of life. Jesus saved us to make us holy. That is to make us where we could live for the glory of God and glorify God with our lives. And he, Jesus, lived on earth to prepare, in part, to prepare and demonstrate the way of holiness for us. It is his purpose that we should walk in his footsteps, resisting evil even to the shedding of blood if need be. And as we speak, there are many, many, many of our Christian brothers and sisters around the world who are at this point shedding blood, being dispossessed of their property, having their families torn asunder, who are being thrown in jail, who are being burned alive and having all sorts of other things happen to them because of the fact and for no other reason than that they are believers in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, count the cost. And I say to you here in the year 2020 in Christendom in America, you count the cost because it may start costing one of these days before too awful long. Your privilege and mine is not just that he saved us, but that he has called us to a holy calling. He has called us to be like him. And that begins at the narrow gate and it continues on the narrow path. And anyone who expects to see Jesus had better be sure that that's the path that he is on. Anything else leads to destruction the likes of which this earth has never seen. But the end of the narrow way is a blessing beyond description for eternity. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, we do not look forward to what this world may hold for us, particularly as things seem to be going in recent days. Satan and his toadies seem to be bringing their forces together to apply them against your church, not only around the world, but here in our country as well. Oh God, be with us as we think about these things, that we might count the cost, and that we might be prepared, O oh Lord, to stand in the narrow way, having walked through the narrow gate, that when we come to the end of it, we might hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the master. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.